when we get into value stream mapping now. So a lot of what people focus on is improving operations. You hear about operational efficiency, trying to make things better. But one of the big insights that was had uh, by this wonderful guy called Shingo, who was the co-developer of the Toyota production system. Has anyone heard of the Toyota production system? Yeah. Cool. It was this thing out of which was born lean manufacturing as a movement, and this idea that a lot of important ideas came out of there. This is a very simple idea that if we look at the whole process, as we generally find more ways to make things better than by making each step better. Um, and the difference between process and operation, in case it's not clear, operation is I'm the operator, I'm at the machine, I'm doing the job. The process is how things move through the factory. And a lot of the time we focus on making the operator better at his job, rather than should he be doing that earlier or later, or could we remove that step completely, or how do we chain the steps better together. And so what we do in value stream mapping is try to map out the process so that we can think about how we change the process and how you're changing that process up. So you've listed out the jobs. You may have felt a tension on your job sheet because actually you do one of those jobs earlier than the in the customer cycle. That's good. And if you switch those order of those jobs, that's important and interesting. So here's an example of a theoretical steel stamping mill, right? So what happens is the steel comes from the steel stamping mill. Pretty straightforward. And then it sits around. You can't read these words, so I can't either unless I get close to this projected a little bit, but for five days the steel sits. Then for one second it goes into the first machine, the very efficient machine. Then for 7.6 days it sits. <laughs> then for 39 seconds it goes into the next machine. 1.8 days it sits. 46 seconds it goes into the next machine. So these are typical like stamping, like it's a stamping mill. These things are boom, 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 the stuff goes through and it waits for the next run. And so it waits another two and a half days, 62 seconds, two days, 40 seconds. The actual time it spends in these machines is low because we've optimized the operations of these machines and they're really fast, clever, efficient machines. But when we look at the whole process, we see there's weeks spent waiting and even though the machines are fast. And so when we look at that, that's our source for finding optimizations. And eventually it has waiting time and then goes to the customer. So how, how does this whole value flow through your system? When do the requests come in? When do you deliver them? We were talking about security, uh, safety gear. Pe the big, one of the biggest potential pains is the amount of time that you have to wait for your gear to arrive because it keeps your plant out of operation. So is, that a, is there a, a process efficiency that you can put in place which is operationally inefficient like carrying a lot of stock or carrying a little stock or getting them to pre-buy stock? or changing to a rental model. How do you change it up to make it work? So we always start with the as-is value stream. This is the jobs to be done as they currently happen or as competitors do them. And we just walk the flow, which means go and make, walk through. And the Japanese word is genshi genbitsu. Go and see for yourself. Genshi genbitsu. <laughs> go and see for yourself. It's canonized in a term that even I have learned. We've actually got to go out there and see for ourselves how this value stream happens, how people engage with this product. And then, for you guys, you don't always know the internal processes, so investigate, be interested in how the internal processes support that, and then sometimes we'll just have to guess, and taking note of times through the process, because if you leave time out, you're kind of missing a large part of the equation. And you might need to zoom out of the value stream a bit to include extra steps, like getting to the shops, or scheduling time to go to the shops, getting to the gym, to find the efficiencies that you're making. But when you can find those, you can articulate better how things are happening. So the as is one, you're looking at the current, and you're aiming for 10 to 15 steps maximum. So this isn't like a 100 step value stream. So this is just, I want to find all the steps that people go through to make things happen. Let me look at the timings. It's very much the same thing as we did with customer jobs. It's just the next layer of information on that. And you can go out and walk the flow on that, speak to someone about the last time that happened, see how long things took, go speak to the, the acquisition department in the company um, with the idea in the front here, speak to them about how long it took them to solve their legal problem, because that time, that cycle time is often one of the biggest value adds you get. And then what you're going to do is draw a value stream. So here, without timings, because we haven't walked the flow for this, is a 
fabricated example of a brick and mortar retail as is value stream. So internally, up front, they need to estimate demand, guess how much people are going to want based on stats or stuff, and always over order and have sales, then order it from the warehouse, get it delivered to the store, get the item on the shelf, and then advertise and promote the item. Then, after advertising and promoting, then the customer now needs to get to the store, enter the store, find the item, pay the till, and then check out. Well, it's a process, right? And you, need, you, you can look at your timings between getting it to the store and entering the store. I come from Cape Town. We have Canal Walk as a shopping center. Mm -hmm. It's biggest mall in <laughs> the southern hemisphere by area. It's called Canal Walk. You walk a lot there, and people don't always <laughs> think about how much you walk in Canal Walk. And, and, and it's a significant thing. People don't like going there so much because of the walk, but they don't always remember that. But if you measure it, you know, there's five minutes spent walking to the mall from your car, or walking to the shop from your car. <laughs> just thinking about that time saving can, can help. Well, what do you do during that? that there's a, you're you're going to be surprised and find something interesting, especially in the barber store. Like, how long do you spend waiting? What do people eat? Why are they eating at that time? Can the barber sell them food? You know, why are they so bored? Play chairs at the barber, I don't know. So then the next step is to imagine your 2B value stream. So you say, that's how it is. What is the change? How are we going to take it to the, to the next level? Imagine how your customer journey will work. So first start with the customer, because you can always change internally a lot, but think about what, what it's going to feel like for the customer. Then look into what your internal value stream needs to look like. What are, what are we going to have to do? What are we going to have to have to support that? And then estimate sometimes through that process. Make stuff up because that's going to be your baseline to go and test against. So you think this is going to happen at that speed. You, you've kept asking about Twitter. You know, what did you do before Twitter? How did you find out stuff? Newspapers. Okay, right. So that was your as is. Articles go into the newspaper. They get published. They get blah, 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 with Twitter. Put it in. It comes out. Oh, wow. That's an interesting change. It's live reporting. Someone can say something. There's no intermediate steps. You can show a quick value stream change around. But a contrived example, very simple. You won't learn much from that, but just to think about the significant differences. A bit of comparison is probably those boards that are the light posts that just have all the headlines. Yeah. That you then click to go through some article, and you go buy the newspaper to read the article. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's all sorts of ways to think about the existing value streams and all the steps. And then when you draw yours, so now you're imagining I'm doing online retail compared to the other one. You're going to mark it, and then you're going to get clicks. Importantly, you don't have internal processes to support getting those clicks, and if you don't have anything after that, you can at least measure that. Right? Then they're going to find items somehow on your website. If you've only got one, it's pretty easy for them to find that one, so you can do that quite quickly. Then you're going to do this magical box called match to supply. Match to supply. And at the moment, in the beginning, that can be human. You don't need clever algorithms or things. You can just go, oh, we need this t-shirt. Someone just asked for that t-shirt. We don't have, I, I need to go buy one, make one, print one, get it together. And then they're going to pay for it somehow with a payment gateway or something, and then you order from the warehouse and get it delivered. So importantly, the change from this process is the ordering from the warehouse happens here weeks before, and here it happens on demand. So it lets you lower your cost. But what happens is this little arrow here, if you put the timings on, it goes high. So that's one of the frustrations of online shopping is the long wait for delivery. So it lets you look at those different tensions and timing. The key that you're looking for is what disruptions you introduce. And people will talk about disruption, and it's one of my hobby horses that people say disruption looks like this when you've got an existing market and a new person comes in and eats their lunch. That's what disruption looks like after the fact. That's not useful to you guys about how to do disruption. Like, yeah, we have to get customers and acquire them and kill the, kill the person who's there already. That doesn't help. Disruption looks like how do you take the way things currently happen and switch them up. We gave the Uber example earlier just to give it again to reinforce it. So the value stream used to be call a cab, sorry, go out to the curb, stand in the rain, wait, wait for a cab, call a cab, get them to come to you, or if you're in South Africa, you know, get a taxi to come to you. You know, not everybody wanted to catch that taxi. They, they might have wanted the meter cabs, but gosh, they were expensive and they were never anywhere. And you'd phone someone, it was horrible. And then eventually you get in the cab, you're watching the meter going the whole time, thinking about the money pouring out of your pocket. <laughs> or you're in a, a minibus taxi and you're like, well, squished against someone else. Neither is cool. Um, and then, then you, 
eventually get to the end and you have to pay either, in Cape Town we call it a gaiki, the, the, the dude who actually takes your money on the side and like, takes you in and out on a, in a minibus taxi, or on the other one now you have to have cash because they didn't have credit cards. And then people thought, let's innovate this industry. So we're going to have credit card processing inside of your meter taxi because that's operational efficiency on the process of payment. And, you know, better ways to make that phone call and get people to, to get you the cab or have taxi waiting ranks. You know, you've got it at the airport, the taxis are waiting. That helps with that problem. But it takes zooming out and looking at the whole value stream as Uber did. Kind of an accident too in the beginning. You know, they, they were focusing around how would you hail a... Um, chauffeur-driven sort of limo-style car, and then they found their value proposition as they went through. But they took away the job of payment. But it's not a better credit card processor if there's nothing in the cash. The driver doesn't handle payments, there's no cash, he doesn't even have a chance to talk about money. You say, thank you for the ride, and you walk away. <laughs> you feel trusted, you feel better, that whole experience is good of walking out of the cab, not having to talk about money because people don't like talking about money. When you hail, so they took that job out of the value stream completely. The hailing process, you do it from the smartphone in your air conditioned space, you call the cab, it tells you how far away the cab is. Once it's there, then you go outside, exposed to the elements and get it. Um, <laughs> and they've switched around those two steps. And there's this, you know, the whole switchery, pokery game, like where's the money? The other part is, changing where the money is extracted. In South Africa, we've got a great example of prepaid airtime. Mm -hmm. So, it was, there was a market that was difficult to address because they weren't credit worthy, you know, people didn't want to have credit agreements, all the banked and unbanked and payments. So by making payment happen before instead of after, mm -hmm. then you opened yourself up to a new market. You could, you could either see that as a change in the value stream Payment is a step that's happened earlier. Because the other thing with changing where value is extracted is moving from a purchase model to a rental model. It's changing how you extract how you extract money. Um, so renting a car versus buying a car, or getting free training material up front and then paying for the book. Before it wouldn't work before the internet, but now that you've got the internet, you could do free videos to try to get people in in a freemium model. And a lot of the internet runs on a freemium model. People will give away content for free, try to get you in, and then convert you later. That's a disruption in most industries because people will say, oh, you're giving away all this free stuff that we used to charge for. So you're changing where the value gets extracted, um, which sh shakes up the value stream. And the, the important thing when you're looking at value streams and disruption is remember that slide right at the beginning where you had the two circles, problem and, like context and problem. And, and in that, I said, zoom in and zoom out of value streams. And, and the, the core to, to this is not to be stuck on, this is my problem, this is what I'm looking at. Think of it as a problem area that you can zoom in and zoom out of. We were chatting now in the last worksheet just around, um, a, 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 he's basically got a dome that helps grow vegetables. Now that's great, but zoom out slightly larger on the value stream. And one of the reasons why people don't eat healthy is because they don't grow their own vegetables but they don't grow their own vegetables so they don't have the equipment or the right education. So all of a sudden now, by adding a booklet of education of what, what to, like here's easy vegetables, here's sunny vegetables, here's shade vegetables. So information might help you sell the product. But so by zooming slightly further out on the value stream, you can find a far more compelling sales proposition instead of trying to zoom in just on one, one section of that. Cool. So again, all of this is hypothesis that you write down. To validate your value stream, you can establish a problem solution fit through interviews, check that people have the problem, that those steps would make sense to them. To actually validate it, you need an MVP, and that can be a concierge MVP, but I need to get out and start delivering that service to people to see how long these things take, get surprised by how long it took someone to call you back from that first engagement, see what's taking a long time, see how we could squeeze that time down. Um, and the way to iterate is always to just do something. Like get out of the building, get your product out of the building, do something on your new value stream, because better beats best. Uh, it's, that's one of, the lean uh, one of the lean phrases. The idea that you, the best thing that you could do, you can spend forever imagining and designing, but if you can do it better and do that today, you're beating sure. that to one day. Even just a little bit better. Yeah. If you can solve your customer's problem a little bit better today, 
it's better than waiting a year to try and deliver the perfect solution. Because you're not going to learn and you're not actually going to improve it. And you can make them be your customer right now, which means you'll learn and iterate. When you do have that solution, you develop towards it.